Hey, for six weeks now, we've been in a teaching series called Different. And what we've been learning is how Jesus lived differently, taught differently, and looked at life differently than anyone else. And more importantly, for those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus, his expectation is that we, like him, would live differently as well. It's a call that sounds so motivating in theory and yet is so unbelievably difficult in practice. But I want you to think about something for a second. When has normal ever worked? I mean, many of us spend hours and hours each year trying to discover a different way to succeed, a different way to lose weight, a different way to find value, or a different way to define our purpose. And if you're watching today and are hesitant about Jesus because it seems he might be asking you to live or do something a little bit different, ask yourself this question, how well has normal been working? See, most of us worried away our teenage years in pursuit of this thing we call normal only to find that it was normal that was sabotaging our lives all along. See, Jesus leads us to live different lives, but our souls have told us every day we've lived that we need something so, so different. And today, we're going to look at Mark chapter 10. And here, Jesus again challenges the concept of normal. And he calls one man in particular to live a life that's different than anything you would ever expect. And his story applies to my life, and it applies to your life so directly that I want to challenge you to lean in and pay close attention today. Here's what happens. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. And right off the bat, what we find is a man who was desperate for different. We may not know what catalyst compelled him to run and fall down, begging for an answer from Jesus, but something was clearly off. Now, Jesus went through the normal list that normal people check off to justify their normal lives. He, he read the commandments to him. Have you killed anyone, slept with anybody's wife, stolen from someone, lied, cheated, or been a rotten son? I love his response. This man reveals so quickly how unsatisfying Jesus' initial answer was to him. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. I mean, you can almost hear the desperation in his voice. I mean, it's like he's saying, look, I have followed the rules. I've paid my taxes. I went to church. I tried to be a good and a nice boy, but something is eating my soul alive from the inside out. I've done everything I know to do, but I am still so empty. I mean, have you ever been there? Maybe right now you're there. You can't put your finger on it. You can't fully wrap your mind around it. Everything seems right from a distance, but deep inside, something is tearing you apart. If that's you, pay attention because your life and this man's life are on parallel tracks. You're headed for the same destination, but Jesus offers this man and you an alternative. Jesus looked at him and said the following, one thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Here comes this man desperate to break the norm and find anything different that would turn his life around. And Jesus looks at him, and for a moment, it seems like everything is about to happen. Jesus tells him there's one single thing he's missing. Now, you have no idea how big of a deal this was. This would be unbelievable news for a Jewish man to hear from a Jewish leader in that time. See, back then, Jews in that time were required to keep the misfit. This was 613 rules and laws that governed their lives and validated their relationship with God. To get it right in life meant uh, to get all 613 rules correct. To get it right with God meant perfection in all 613 rules. Jesus looks at this man and tells him he's not missing a list of 100 things, 
He's not even missing 50 things. It's not even 10 things. There was only one thing that stood between him and the aching of his soul. The problem was that one thing, it was everything. Simple? Yeah. Easy? No. In the blink of an eye, the man assesses the situation. He saw the pros, the cons, the costs, and the potential return on investment. And here, Bart takes specific note of his response. It says this, At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Does anyone other than me get a little nervous when they read this part of the story? I mean, we, we try to twist it into a thousand different directions. We try to imagine that this story really only applies to someone who is truly wealthy, who has more than we do. We pretend that it might be some other kind of meaning that's embedded in the story that Jesus was getting you know, after and, and that ultimately gets us off the hook. Some of us even understand that Jesus was simply asking for the one thing this man refused to give God control of, but we ignore in that moment the fact that Jesus is likely to demand the same thing from us, that he ultimately requires control of our finances and our lives too. How do I know this? Well, Jesus didn't stop talking when the man walked away. Here's what happens next. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Make no mistake about it. Jesus was having a financial conversation. And Mark continues the story. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, after four years in Bible college, 18 years in ministry, and multiple sermons, podcasts, and books later, do you know what I've finally been revealed about this scripture? Do you know what God has finally shown me that the true meaning is? Pay attention here. This is important. Lean in right now. Turn up your volume because this is a big deal. Jesus was actually trying to tell his disciples that it's hard for rich people to go to heaven. Hear me again, it's hard for rich people to go to heaven. He says it so plainly, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. See, this should concern you. It concerns me. It should concern all of us because if you're watching online with a computer that has internet connection, you're rich too. As a matter of fact, you're crazy rich when you look at it in terms of the entire world. Did you know that one quarter of the world's population lives on less than $3.50 per day? That's less than $1,300 per year. Many of us spend more than that on lattes in half the year. Nearly half the world's population lives on $5.50 or less per day. That's barely $2,000 a year. The average household income in Cary, North Carolina, for example, is $101,000 per year. If you live in Wake County, the average household income is around $90,000 a year. That means if you live in one of those two locations and fall within the average income brackets for those areas, you make between 50 and 79 times more money than the vast majority of the world. You have between 50 and 70 times, 79 times more money to spend every single day than most people on the planet. Now, whether you earn double that or half of it, we have to admit that we fall well within the definition of incredible wealth when it comes to a global perspective. So there's a phrase that we we all kind of know innately. It's the phrase that you've probably said, and I know that I've said before too. It's this, that money changes People, you've said it before and I've said it before, but I love how Francis Chan takes this phrase and what he says about it. He says that while everyone uses the phrase money changes people, what he's never heard anyone say is money changes me. See, what we see so easily in others is almost always the last thing we admit about ourselves, isn't it? But Jesus tells us that money changes the ease at which we experience relationship with him. Why? 
Well, the less we need practically, the less we need faith. Think about it. When when were the times in your life when you were the most desperate for God or an answer from him? When did you cry out to him the most? When did you pursue him the most? When did you run after him the most? See, I can almost guarantee you that there was a physical need, a financial need, or a practical need that pushed you in desperation closer and closer in his direction. See, it's not that having wealth is bad. It's not. The Bible celebrates several wealthy people who changed the world with their wealth for the kingdom of God. Wealth simply masks one of the obvious areas of our need that we have for God, God as our provider. It makes us less able to recognize how desperate we are every single day to have him. See, most of us right now live in the triangle area. And this area that we call home is one of the most sought after cities and one of the greatest countries on the planet. Housing costs are lower than most other growing cities. Jobs pay more. Unemployment is lower. Opportunity is plentiful. And what we have to recognize is important. This puts us at a significant risk. And the sooner we come to grips with that, the sooner we can confront it and grow beyond it. See, in the book of Revelation, Jesus challenges a church in a very similar situation, a church that I believe today might actually be located somewhere like the triangle. Here's what he says, Revelation chapter three, beginning in verse 14. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say that I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, Jesus was confronting the church because their faith was shrinking as their prosperity grew. He didn't tell them that their wealth was wrong or sinful because it wasn't. He does tell them that it had become an obstacle to their faith and relationship with him. Now, on the outside, it looked like they had everything together. On the inside, Jesus says they're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And the hardest part was that they had no idea who they thought they were and who they actually were. Who they thought they might become and who they were becoming were as different as night and day. And I want you to pause for a second and ask yourself a vital question. How's your heart? How are you and God? Maybe more importantly, you need to pause right now and ask God that question. See, where we live and how we live puts us at risk of losing out on the one thing Jesus offered this rich young man that he couldn't purchase anywhere else. It's what he offered this church as well. Listen and hear the heart of a loving father who wants his child back, who wants you back, who wants me back. He says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. See, understand this. They didn't even know how bad things had gotten. Jesus offers them this ability to see, something to cleanse the blindness that they had found in evaluating their own self. And as I found myself reading this verse this week, I found myself asking Jesus to help me see as well. Would you ask him the same? See, Jesus shows uh, us and reminds us of his loving intent for each and every one of us. He did the same for that church. Here's what he says. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll eat with that person and they with me. Jesus was calling them away from lesser lovers, away from other dependencies, and away from other gods so that he could regain the first place in their hearts and in their lives again. Hear me. The reason Jesus has this conversation with the church, with the young man, and with you and me today is simple. He desires a deep, real, and tangible relationship, and he will never be satisfied until nothing stands in the way of that relationship. Our big idea says it this way, and it puts it a little harshly. Jesus gets first place with me 
or I get no place with him. Let me say that again. Jesus gets first place with me or I get no place with him. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? Can I admit, I've erased that sentence at least five different times. I've tried to find a nicer way to put it, a cleaner way to put it, but Jesus used the ways that he spoke intentionally. He spoke these words harsh on purpose because he knew if he wasn't direct, we'd miss it. But it's true because God is so so good. He's too good to let us believe that we have something that we actually don't. It's true because he knows the outcome of a life dependent on anything but him. Jesus was direct out of his passionate, crazy, ridiculous love for you and for me, for the Laodicean church and for the rich young man. I mean, think about what was offered to this rich young ruler or to the church in Laodicea. Relationship with the creator of the universe, a connection with the greatest provider of all times, access to the mind and to the wisdom of God himself, eternity, heaven, forgiveness, life, peace, and a resource in every possible situation. They were offered everything. It's like trading a dollar in for a million dollars. When you see that kind of deal offered, you'd be a fool to turn it down. Just before Ashley and I moved to Kansas to go start a church, I made kind of a ridiculous decision. I bought a brand new 2013 flame blue F-150 five liter V8 and I loved that truck. But to buy it, I fretted for weeks and weeks and weeks. I emailed every sales manager in a hundred mile radius and said, give me your best deal. Then I took that best deal and I emailed it out to everyone else again. I did it over and over and over until I got that truck as cheap as I could. But even then I was a nervous wreck. I'd never spent that much money on a vehicle in my life. And I was scared to give up and sacrifice that much money. As a matter of fact, it bothered me so much that I sold it at a huge loss only a few months later. Now, a couple of years ago, I was searching on Craigslist in Florida and I found a 2013 flame blue F-150 five liter V8. I mean, it was pound for pound the exact same truck that I sold. It even had the exact same mileage that the other one had when I sold it. But this time things were different. This time it was half the price. This time I didn't worry about it for a second. Without even talking to Ashley, I bought a plane ticket. I pulled the money out of savings. I hopped a plane the next day and I drove it home. We didn't wind up in marriage counseling. Don't worry, everything was fine. These two trucks were exactly the same, but my experience with them were wildly different. See, in the first truck, All I could focus on was how much I was going to have to give up to get what I was after. But with the second truck, I was fixated on just how much I was getting. I mean, it was the deal of a lifetime. And this is the same kind of deal that Jesus offers each and every person on the face of the planet. It's the deal that he offers me right now in this moment. It's the deal he's offering you. See, Jesus takes responsibility for our sin, our failure, our future, and our provision. And in exchange, guess what he asks for? He asks for our sin, our failure, our future, and our provision. Jesus only asks from us the very things he promises to replace. He offers and requires everything. And this is why Jesus can demand so much and yet remains so good. Jesus gets first place with me or I get no place with him. And if this commitment seems impossible to you, take heart because it seemed that way to the disciples too. As the young man walked away sadly, the disciples were blown away. I mean, Jesus seemed to be talking crazy talk. Here's what we see as Mark gives us a picture. It says the disciples were even more amazed and they said to one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And then then Peter has this kind of aha moment and he speaks up. It was kind of his niche thing to do. Then Peter spoke up and he said this, we have left everything to follow you. 
They had started following Jesus in this crazy kind of way and they didn't even realize it. Jesus was so good, they hadn't even noticed how much they'd walked away from. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who's left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus promises him that regardless of what they walk away from, that he remains faithful as a provider, not only in this world, not only in their troubles like persecutions, but also a provider for eternity, something they had no ability to control themselves. Make no mistake about it. Following Jesus will always come at a cost. Sometimes it will be a big cost. Maybe Jesus is asking you for something big right now. Don't walk away. Sometimes the cost will be less. But there is nothing we will give up in pursuit of Jesus that will ever cost us more than what he has already given for us. We will always have more in him than he could, we could ever dream to give. He will always have given more for us than we will ever have to offer. See, I've prayed for you this week. To be honest, I've prayed for me. I want us to have honest hearts about where we are with God. I want God to put that same salve on my eyes and your eyes that he promised to Laodicea in church, that we would see ourselves as we are before God and recognize how crazy his love is. I pray that God would give you eyes to see exactly who you are and where you are in relationship with him. I pray that your heart will be strengthened to the point that you could let go of anything that has cooled your heart or robbed you of your faith in Jesus. I pray right now that you would have the boldness to run back to him and find him so much better than anything you had to leave behind. Maybe right now you need to fall on your knees in your living room. Maybe you're in your car and you need to pull over. Maybe you're alone in your bedroom and you need to simply pray, Father, I have wandered. My heart's grown cold. I'm not where I should be. Would you take me back? And here's the incredible news of your heavenly loving Father. The answer is always yes. So right where you are, would you pray? return. Nothing could be more important than managing the passions and the commitment and the pursuit that you have of Jesus. It changes everything. Let's pray. God, I pray right now for the people who are watching this video. Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal to them where they truly stand with you. I pray, God, that you would reveal how passionately you love us and that you would pull back the fear we have of returning, that you would pull back the fear that we have of letting go of the things that we've made idols or other gods in our lives, and that you would help us to let go and run with full abandon back to your heart. God, may we find you to be just as loving as our hearts have been telling us you are, just as as accepting as we need you to be. God, find us. Don't leave us here alone. God, take us and change us. Use us how we need to be. Amen.